Welcome to the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 602. This week, we have a couple of Tinker Boards, a Tinker Board 2 gig and a Tinker Board S. These are single board computers, about the same form factor as a Raspberry Pi. We're going to get into the box and fire one up and see how they operate for us as well. Um, also, uh, we have our Maker of the Month. And uh, we're going to be looking at a very cool project on a Raspberry Pi. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. cat 5 TV slash IAIB. Hey everybody, I'm Robbie. I'm Sasha. And I'm back. Whoa, where'd you <laughs> come from? No, I'm Jeff. But hey I'm back. Jeff. How you been, my man? Good. I've been away for a couple of weeks because work's just been busy. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's the new thing. Like, I was like, why aren't you here? Work. Sasha and I were talking before each broadcast. Okay, well, what are we going to say Jeff's excuses this week? <laughs> I right. think last week's was like you were getting your teeth flossed or something like that. I'd... Beard perm. Beard, yeah, perm. Oh, come oh, on. That, that really? would look lovely yeah. on oh, you, Jeff. You are horrible. No, well, we had, to, we had, to, we had to let the viewers know... That we were still thinking of. Oh. Yeah. We've got a fantastic show planned for you tonight. Uh, before we jump into it, though, make sure that you subscribe to us on YouTube. And while you're there, uh, click that bell in order to receive notifications whenever we're live or when we post exciting new material. So um, you both are subscribed on YouTube. You've clicked yes. the bell. You get the notifications. Jeff said before the show, what did you say? Look. I don't remember. We're they're, on live. Yeah, we're live. they're live. <laughs> I was like, I said so many things before the show. I don't remember which one. <laughs> yes, we're live. In relation to the current conversation, <laughs> Jeff. So yes. if you were to take what I was saying and actually use context, <clears> you'd <throat> probably figure out what we said before the show. Yeah. That was fantastic. But yeah, he <laughs> noticed that we were live because YouTube notified him that Category 5 TV was live. And that's something that you can get just by simply clicking that bell as well. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Asus Tinkerboard, not only the Tinkerboard 2 gigabyte, but also the S model, which is the newer kind of enhanced version. And I want to look at uh, what makes those two devices different because they're very, very close together. So okay. can I jump over there and we're going to yes. get a look at these devices? Absolutely. Hey folks, so first of all, we've got the Tinkerboard 2 gigabyte and the Tinkerboard S. So Two gigabyte. I mean, this is the this is the original model. They call it the two GB, and then we've got the S as well. Before I start, I want to mention that we have a coupon code. If you want to head on over to Ameridroid.com, we all know and love them. Uh, you can save up to twenty five dollars off of this board if you use the coupon code ATBS dollar sign twenty five off just like you see on your screen down there. This one here, we can save $7. ATB dollar sign, seven off. Got it? Okay. So, first of all, we're gonna jump into the Tinkerboard. The, this is the original Tinkerboard packaging. This is the Tinkerboard two gigabyte. And let's just jump right into it, folks. I'm really excited about these because Asus has taken the form factor of a Raspberry Pi and said, okay, well, let's actually give it a little bit more powerful, uh, a little more power, um, and definitely, you know, two, two times the amount of memory on this board. So we've got two gigabytes of onboard memory. We've got 4K video output at 30 frames per second. We still have a Raspberry Pi... Uh, GPIO. However, the Tinkerboard, as you see, is quite cleverly color-coded. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely looking board, if you, if you can say that. But if you can see, it, it looks very, very much like a Raspberry Pi or a Raspberry Pi 3 as far as the form factor goes. And so much so, we're going to see tonight that it's, in fact, so similar that it'll work in the, uh, in the case. What else do we have in the box for the Tinkerboard 2 gigabyte. We've got a heatsink and some paperwork. 
instructions, which we'll just kind of put back in the box. Okay, Jeff? Okay. <laughs> He's like, read the manual. All right, so there is the Tinkerboard, and now let's get into the Tinkerboard S. So this is the next model, and this is kind of, I would say that this is an enhanced version of the same board. What do we notice? It, it looks the same. It looks... Like identical. Identical. Like Be careful. <laughs> Label them, whatever you need to do. Make sure you know what, what one is what. So on the right-hand side of your screen, that is the Tinkerboard S. On the left-hand side of your screen is the Tinkerboard 2 gigabyte. What about underneath? Is there different identification on the bottom? What is different here? Oh, okay, the so color. Green. Yeah, we've got green on the Tinkerboard. And what does it say? I'm going to turn this around so I can see it. It says revision 1.2. On this one, it's blue. Blue text okay. on the, the PCB, and it says, strangely, revision 1.01. .01. Huh. Wait a minute. This is a lower revision. However, it does say Tinkerboard S. Let's get a focus on that so that you can see. Oh, yeah. There it is. So it says right on it, Tinkerboard S revision 1.01. .01. In the box, again... Heat sink for the CPU, the, or the, uh, the SOC, and some information. I saw that there is a diagram for the, uh, the GPIO, which is important for us if we're going to start making. And let's get rid of the box, get rid of all the packaging. Okay, specifications-wise, the SOC on both of these boards are identical. So this is 1.8 gigahertz and the SOC of these boards is the RK3288 uh, that is a quad core R, uh, uh, SOC on the board we have two gigabytes of DDR4 RAM on both of these boards so so far they're identical same SOC or to put that in terms that we understand a little better we'll say CPU System on chip is SOC, um, so it's like a CPU that has uh, that is for the, uh, the the single board computing. We've got two gigabytes of, uh, and I said DDR4. I I beg your pardon. It is DDR3 on these boards. The GPU is actually pretty impressive at 4K30. Uh, I believe it is. It's a Mali T764 on both of these boards. So again, they're identical up to this point. 802.11 B, G, and N Wi-Fi is uh, integrated into both of these boards and gigabit Ethernet. So if we're looking at this from the perspective of a Raspberry Pi and people are saying on YouTube, you know, why do you constantly compare these single board computers to Raspberry Pis? And part of that is because we're all familiar with a Raspberry Pi, yes? Mm -hmm. yep. We can agree that we all know what a Raspberry Pi looks like and how it operates and what it is and its form factor. So if I say, hey, this is the same form factor as a Raspberry Pi or this is the same shape and same size as a Raspberry Pi 3, you can grasp what that means. And so I'm not saying, I'm not trying to compare to a Raspberry Pi, but it's a benchmark, and they've certainly sent, set the bar for single board computers. And both of these systems are so close in form factor to a Raspberry Pi 3 that you can, in fact, use a Raspberry Pi case for these devices. Cool. Oh, that's handy. As I mentioned, both have the color-coded GPIO, which is helpful if you are a tinkerer. But why, then... If these are so identical, they've got the same SOC, they've got the same amount of RAM, the same type of RAM, the same, uh, the same Mali graphics adapter, they've got great audio. These actually have uh, fantastic audio, 192 24-bit HD audio, so 192 kilohertz. Um, so it's, it's like better than CD quality, um, excellent audio coming off of both of these boards if you want to use them for audio or uh, like if you want to put this in as a, like a music player or something like that on your, on your home theater system, be perfect for that. So what sets these two apart? Well, the Tinkerboard S takes things a little bit to the next level. Let's look at the back side of the Tinkerboard and the Tinkerboard S. We see that both of these have a micro SD card reader. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. So this is going to take your storage. However, there's one thing that's a little bit different on the S model. And I think that's what we're looking at right there. We have, in fact, 16 gigabytes. Now, we do have 
the SD card reader, micro SD, but we also have 16 gigabytes of eMMC storage built into this board. So this is something that we have oh, nice. not seen in a lot of SBCs. Typically, we have to buy extra storage for our SBCs. This one has 16 gigabytes built in. So where we would normally have to flash to an eMMC card or to a, an SD card, with the Tinkerboard S, we in fact can plug in an, an, OT, like an OTG cable or a, a USB cable into the, uh, into the board, fire it up, and actually flash directly to the eMMC that is on chip. So the storage is built in. We don't have to buy that separately. It's all there. It also has Bluetooth 4.0 plus EDR. Um, so if you want to use it with wireless speakers, wireless headphones, those kinds of things, or any other Bluetooth device, that is built into the S. And those are kind of the core differences with those two boards. This is just an enhanced version with the eMMC, with the Bluetooth, and uh, otherwise they're pretty much identical as far as I can see. So I mentioned that uh, we can actually use a Raspberry Pi case. So I've pulled out a KKSB case, and let's get a look at this and see how this is going to work. So this, I don't know if you can see, is a Raspberry Pi 3 case from KKSB. Okay, so if what I'm saying is true, the Tinkerboard should work perfectly within this case, which was in fact designed for a Raspberry Pi. So if I put that in there, now I have, of course, four screws that I'm going to screw in if I was doing this uh, as a, like a permanent installation, but just for the sake of our demonstration, we can see that the holes do align up. See those? Okay, audio, HDMI, everything lines up. And how does everything else line up here? Let's put the cover on the case. I love KKSB cases, by the way. These are, uh, these are steel cases, not aluminum, and uh, they are very high quality. So that is a Tinkerboard S now inside a Raspberry Pi 3 case from KKSB. And look at how beautiful that looks. That is perfect. Isn't that nice? So we have links for all of these products. Um, if you'd like to support the show or if you just want an easy way to get these, go to cat5.tv slash tinkerboard. And we're going to have the case. We're going to have the boards as well, plus the links to Ameridroid, the coupon codes, everything else. I'm going to jump over to, uh, to the set here. Bring it with me. Yeah. Let's Give there it you go. a look. So head on over to cat5.tv slash tinkerboard to check these out. Um, when we come back from a quick break, we're going to actually plug this in. I'm going to fire it up and we're going to see how it performs right after this. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and today we are looking at the Asus Tinkerboard, and we've got the Tinkerboard S as well, and I've fired it up with Tinker OS. So just during the break there, we plugged it in there. It only took about 10 seconds, yes. right, if anyone asks. Yeah, it was quick. Yeah. Oh, Very absolutely. Um, <laughs> so I downloaded it from their website. I flashed it to an SD card just for the sake of the show, just be able to plug it in uh, because we have never tested this. We just unboxed it for you and have fired it up. So let's jump over to the ASUS Tinker board on Tinker OS. And here we are in uh, April 2019. This is what it looks like. Um, so first of all, as a Linux user, it looks like, uh, LXDE mm. right out of the box and looks great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, super responsive. Now I'm looking at the Asus Tinkerboard 2 gigabyte here today. Um, and of course the, um, the S 
is going to be more powerful. So out of the box, we have just generic kind of tools. We've got Vim on there, like a text editor, uh, Calculator, which is Calculator. And I, say, I do say that with like a, ah, oh, Linux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just call it Calculator, shall we? <laughs> uh, under education, we've got Scratch, Scratch GPIO. Uh, internet, what do we have? We have Chromium. This is all out of the box, okay. folks. I haven't installed anything. VNC Viewer. Under programming, we've got uh, Idle, which is Python, Scratch again, and Sound and Video. We've got a media player, system tools. So let's, uh, let's jump up to, you know, if we jump into Chrome, just to kind of gauge how things run. Now, with this device, of course, this is a, a single board computer, and it literally is like what you see is what you get. I've just plugged in HDMI and power and a micro SD card, and I've got a, a wireless dongle for my mouse. So, right. um, so you, can, you can connect everything together and, and boot it up, and you're, you're good to go. So whether you plug that into a TV via HDMI, if you plug that into a computer screen, it becomes a computer, whatever you want to use it for. So it's got the GPIO. You can connect things like um, just like you can with a Raspberry Pi. If you want to you become a maker and start doing like LED lights is a good place to start. I think that's a really great sp mm -hmm. uh, spot to start, and uh, and then take it from there. But it's a lot more powerful than uh, than you know like a Raspberry Pi, and I, I hate to say that because I know I, like I, but everybody right. that's the that's the, that is the baseline. Yeah. Like Raspberry Pi has created a baseline. So what we're looking at is a board that is the same form factor. It operates much the same way. It uses the same kind of software. It's got the same kind of GPIO, but it's a lot faster. Right. It's got twice as much RAM, and it operates really, really well. So ASUS doesn't quite have the, I mean, they, they by far do not have the same community as, say, Raspberry Pi. Right. They don't have the same kind of open source community that you would find in, like, Pine64. Right. Um, and, and it's growing, but it's, it's not quite there yet. So we can become a part of that by by purchasing one of these getting up and running and and playing around so over the next little while we're going to start to see some benchmarks coming in right uh, our giggle scores are going to start coming in with nems linux um, if you're interested in seeing how these kind of boards um, these single board computers benchmark against one another you can head over to nemslinux.com slash stats and you'll be able to see each of these boards and how they're performing and how they stack up so a giggle score shows you the value for the money and speaking of we do have a coupon which really plays into that yes um, so you can actually save $25 off of the cost of the Asus Tinkerboard uh, S, right. which is the, the, the model that has the Bluetooth, has the EMMC built in. So I'm going to post the links for you below in the description so that you've got access to those. Um, and uh, all the information is available at our website, cat5.tv slash Tinkerboard. So out of the box, not a lot comes pre-installed, but of course this is Linux, and the S has a 16 gigabyte um, eMMC, and of course either board you can plug in a uh, an SD card, micro SD, and uh, that gives you extra space as well, and so you can install pretty much anything you like. So what package manager do we have here? Do we have anything? File manager, we've got HTOP. What do we have under preferences? Let's see. Synaptic Package Manager. So we have Synaptic already installed. So this is a Debian-based um, OS. It's asking wow. me for a password, which I can get off of. Uh, now, I installed Tinker OS. Um, so I'm going to grab that password from them. And then I'm going to be able to install anything from the repository. So that can be right. games. That can be anything at all. Right. Cool very, stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so we're going to be looking at those in the next little while. Of course, the comparisons are... Um, Awesome over on nemslinux.com uh, slash stats. I love the comparisons. I love seeing um, how each board stacks up. And when we look at the giggle score, which is the value for the money versus the performance, which is really what we're interested in with these boards as well, uh, we're going to be able to see. So that coupon that you where get, is that does sweet that. Spot? That's going to affect the giggle score. Yeah, that's going to increase the giggle score. Like, it'll make it better. It's going to decrease. Decrease. Yeah. Which means Low the lower it is, the, the better, better the value. Total. Yeah. So when you consider you apply a coupon, which 
just going to save you money. And now all of a sudden the value for, uh, for the cost mm -hmm. is way better than it is at full price, especially right. when you're saving 25 bucks. Like that's huge. So you can pick up your Asus Tinkerboard at cat5.tv slash Tinkerboard. Sasha, we're going to head over to the newsroom. I know you've got some great stories on deck for us, so take her away. All right. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Mark Zuckerberg says regulators and governments should play a more active role in controlling internet content. TP-Link's all-in-one SR20 smart home router allows arbitrary command execution from a local network connection. Office Depot and Support.com have settled out of court and coughed up $35 million after they were accused of lying to people that their PCs were infected with malware in order to charge them cleanup fees. And effective immediately, Microsoft is ending all ebook sales in its Microsoft Store for Windows PCs. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston. Yaman. Yeah, you're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Mark Zuckerberg says regulators and governments should play a more active role in controlling internet content. In an op-ed published in the Washington Post, Facebook's chief says that the responsibility for monitoring harmful content is too great for firms alone. He calls for new laws in four areas, quote, harmful content election integrity, privacy, and data portability. It comes two weeks after a gunman used the site to live stream his attack on a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand. Mr. Zuckerberg writes, quote, lawmakers often tell me we have too much power over speech and frankly, I agree, end quote. He describes a new set of rules he would like to see enforced on tech companies and he says these new regulations should be the same for all websites so that it's easier to stop, quote, harmful content from spreading quickly across pl platforms. The letter, the open letter, which will also be published in some European newspapers, comes as the social network faces questions over its role in the Cambridge Analytica scandal around data misuse during the election campaigns. The site has also been criticized for failing to stop the spread of footage of the Christchurch killings in which 50 Muslims died as they prayed. Mr. Zuckerberg's letter did not specifically name these incidents. However, the site earlier announced that it was considering introducing restrictions on live streaming in the wake of the Christchurch attacks. On Thursday, it also said that it would ban white nationalism and separatism from the site. On Friday, it also started labeling political ads appearing on Facebook in EU countries showing how the advertiser, who the advertiser is, how much they paid, and who they've targeted. Mr. Zuckerberg says Quote, Facebook has a responsibility to help address these issues, and I'm looking forward to discussing them with lawmakers around the world. End quote. Hmm. I don't envy them, for sure. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, heavy, it's a heavy topic. And I think... What's that mean, Jeff? I think that Mr. Zuckerberg has bitten off more than he can chew and now realizes it. I think he's, he's bang on, though, in stating that this should not necessarily fall on the shoulders of the individual site creators. Right. And we know that Facebook has misstepped over content mm -hmm. privacy and, and some of the decisions that they've made. We know that. But they're yeah. also a company. Right. They're not regulators. They're not there to, you know, they're not, that they're 
their goal wasn't to become content regulators. Right. But that's there, something that they have to do. There does need to be laws made in that regard. It, I just, I don't envy them because it, like you create platforms, you create things thinking that they're going to be used for good. Yeah. I, I, here, the topic aside, my problem the one that's really irking me with this story mm -hmm. is I feel like this is nothing more than a PR passing of the buck. Like we There's just, an essence of that. Yes. Yes, We've but just gone through this massive investigation in, sure. in Congress and all that kind of stuff dealing with uh, Facebook and what's going on mm -hmm. in the internet. And the whole time Zuckerberg's like, I don't know what you're talking about. We like, we just sell ads. That's what we do. It's not our problem. We don't know how people use a platform. And now he turns around and goes, Government, you got to take control. Like it's it's a complete about face, and like it, it, to me, it sounds like a PR thing because he's going to get lambasted again for not having a little bit, Jeff. But, but but I do agree with the fact that you know what you screwed it up. Somebody else has to put the yeah. rules in place. It's I mm -hmm. feel like this is a little bit him saying this is just too much for me, and it's true. It is too much for him. Well, it yeah, is. He yes. He uh, needs we, help. We, we and for his for company. Years. Right. But, but I and think for that, his company. Like if yeah. I founded a company that had this really great feature set, I don't ever think, oh, this is going to be used for this purpose. Right. Exactly. That's where I'm like, yeah, it's definitely a PR thing. But at the same time, I would be beside myself as a CEO, as a, as a founder of a company to, to be like, okay, what the heck am I going to do? Right. Like, this is not what this was built for. Well, it, it's not. But, I mean, at the end of the day, if technology has taught us anything, it's that the original purpose is not what it ends up getting used for when it comes to humans. We right. find another way to use it. And, right. And I... <sighs> As I a creative person, though. Like this, though. No, I know. But is he not correct, at least to some degree, in saying that this should not all fall on him his company and and similarly it shouldn't all fall on youtube and google and it shouldn't all fall like there yes, should be I, yes. yeah because that was never the intention this is not what it was built for and also mm -hmm. their company is not a regulator no it's not i i agree there should be some parameters around it i just what bothers me about this is i feel like it's it's a total hey i'm not the problem when all along he he's part of the problem he started the okay. problem, to be clear. Yeah, no, there's like a part Facebook of that. Facebook changed sure. the internet rules. Yeah. I remember when Facebook's whole thing was, well, unless you tell us not to, we're going to open you up to the world. And that was yeah. a whole new concept. And ever since then, Facebook has changed the way everything's been done on the internet. Mm -hmm. And now we have this internet world we're in because of the influence of Facebook. So then to turn around and go, oh, man, we, ooh, it's beyond us. It's like, well, didn't you think about the power you had before? Yeah. It's a little bit oh, too it's late. It's so tough. But it's so tough. It is. It's hard. Uh. I mean, I think that right now he said what he needs to say. Like and he and I think he knows now. Yeah. There di there does need to be more involvement and policies and regulations. Mm -hmm. And he he can't implement them. It needs to be the government that does. Yep. And and I want to say this with all due respect and with a, a certain sensitivity to what has gone on in Christchurch, but you you are a hunter, and so you you purchase guns. Yep. And some of our viewers, same thing. And it's the responsibility of the regulators in order to make sure that those guns are getting into the hands of hunters mm -hmm. and into law-abiding citizens' hands. Yeah. There's, not, there's regulations on all that. Right. And not to make that as a comparison, but just to say, isn't it sort of similar in that it doesn't, it, it shouldn't fall on the manufacturer or on the creator of the tool to regulate it. And that there should, I think he's very correct in saying mm -hmm. that this should be something that the government is stepping up and regulating. I, I'm not saying that I'm for or, pro or, or anti-regulation. I'm just saying maybe it should be, if it has to be regulated, mm -hmm. it should be 
on a higher level than the individual companies. It shouldn't fall on Facebook. It should fall on the government because the government can make that a blanket regulation that impacts all of the social media sites. If Facebook goes down and another social media site rises up, mm -hmm. I want those same regulations mm -hmm. to now impact the security and privacy and everything else yeah. and, and the, the way content streaming is used on those platforms as much as they were on Facebook. No, I, so I shouldn't agree. it be the regulators or the government that is in charge of that? Yeah, I, I agree. That's what government's role is. It's, mm -hmm. it's to keep the country and its population safe and to make sure everything Yeah, and it's runs. not just a physical safety. No, it's, mm -hmm. it's so much more. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I, you know, anyway, yeah. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, it's, I feel it's like a very open-ended. On it's one. a very yeah. open-ended conversation, and, and we could have loads of opinions. Uh, please share yours. Comment below. Let us know what you think. Uh, just uh, post a comment, and we'd love to have that discussion with you. TP-Link's all-in-one SR20 smart home router allows arbitrary command execution from a local network connection. Last Wednesday, 90 days after he informed TP-Link of the issue and received no response, Matthew Garrett, a well-known Google security engineer and open source contributor, disclosed a proof of concept exploit to demonstrate a vulnerability affecting TP-Link's router. The 38-line script shows that you can execute any command you choose on the device with root privileges oh. without authentication. Garrett explained that TP-Link's hardware often incorporates TDDP, the TP-Link device debug protocol, which has had multiple vulnerabilities in the past. Among them, version 1 did not require a password. Vulnerability to a local attack could be exploited if an attacker manages to get a malicious download onto a machine connected to an SR20 router. Garrett is urging TP-Link to provide a way to report security flaws and no to ship debug not to ship debug daemons on production firmware. Firmware. Oh man. So, yeah. A router like this, so you don't don't necessarily think about it, but the router, the device that you plug your internet into <laughs> and all your computers into, is a computer. Yep. Right. And that computer, if it's stupidly configured. <laughs> Can Which? run arbitrary code, or in yep. this case, pretty much anything that the yeah. attacker wants to run on your TP-Link router. Now, the first one didn't require a password, but all the rest of them since then have. Is that, I suppose? Well, it's, it has to do with the first generation of the, the firmware. Right. And, and some of that code is still in existence, even in the right. newer firmware. Oh, okay. So the, the exploit can still affect... Um, future iterations as well. Uh, but the, f the simple fact that, uh, hey, this was reported 90 days prior, and TP-Link has not done anything about it or even responded to the security researcher, is, it just kind of shows that, oh, this is, this is a big problem, right? and you're not really taking the necessary steps to resolve it. Yeah. Like when I had, if I had something like this come up, mm -hmm. and when I have something come up, in my own, um, in, in my workplace. Yeah. Like, it's dealt with the same day. Yeah. Not ignored for 90 days? Not ignored <laughs> for 90 days. Like, this is something that is not a small thing. This is the root execution. So understand, that's like the administrator rights right. to your network. And this is the very device that connects all your computers together and connects them to the internet. And with that, so they're allowed to run any code. TP-Link, like the router itself, is that like a router that would be used not only just in homes? Like, could it be used in offices and sure, they buy like it, for their it office. could, right? Yeah, like, I mean it's a consumer device, but um, well, like, what's what's the SR20? Like, if I do a quick search, let's see what the SR20 looks like here, Sasha. TP-Link. If somebody was, yeah, it's just a home router. Yep. Okay. I mean, not like, like to me anyways. But I mean, how many small that. businesses have just a simple home router? I mean, that's quite common. Yeah. So we discussed how how hard it would be if something crashed to back everything to bring it back up. So if you had your router, I'm confused as to like would if somebody went on into your router, could it it could crash everything? It's and not about crashing. It's that they can now infiltrate. Yeah. Right. Access everything. 
And ransomware is a very big threat these right. days. Okay, right. Okay, so I am right. I'm right on the on the right line where then you could lose not only the business now, like the, it was the aluminum factory. Yeah. Right. The ransomware. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's reminiscent of that in my mm -hmm. mind. Okay. Yeah. I, I have these discussions often about cybersecurity and, and you know, what, what makes us exploitable. And, mm -hmm. and people think, oh, well, no, nobody's interested in us. But now that this is publicly known information, it's just a simple script that yeah. goes out on the internet and looks for these routers. And as soon as it finds them, what does it do? It installs arbitrary code into that router. Now understand, it has to get in through the LAN, so they have to compromise a, a computer to get into the router. Mm -hmm. But when they do, now they can run anything. That's right. So now, and this is what happens, they're not interested in you. Quite quite frankly, the small business that's using one of those routers as their home, as their business router, yep. they're probably not interested in what you have, but they might be interested in your vendors. They might that's be right. interested in other companies. So all of a sudden, so they infiltrate your network. They get access to your email. They get access to the flow of traffic and they say, okay, well, you're dealing with, okay, you're dealing with this vendor. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an aluminum vendor. Right. right? Let's just put yep. a, a scenario in there. So n now, we have your email. We have the capability of sending email from your email because we've infiltrated your router. We know who your vendor is, this aluminum company, and now we're going to send them our code and we're going to disguise it as an invoice. That's right. Right. And as soon as it gets to that aluminum company, now the person who is not cybersecurity trained and, and knowledgeable about watching for phishing attacks and those kinds of threats, sees that email and says, okay, you know, here's an invoice from such and such company that, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to open that and guess what? Now, you can see the right? ripple effect of yeah. that. It, yeah. It's not necessarily you that is being attacked. It's that now you've got a device that is exploitable. So connected with. It could be you that's attacked though. And if you're a small business, then it's going to put you out of business. Yep. Right. Plain and simple. If your backups are not good or if you can't stand to be offline for 30 days, yeah. then guess what? I mean, we had the d discussion that Hydro is a huge company. Right. This yeah. aluminum manufacturer, like, they can recover easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll just absorb it and write it off. But a small company with 10 computers and t 10 employees, it could put you out of business. Very easily. So, yeah. um, so, you know, keep those things in mind when we talk about these kinds of exploits. It's not something to take lightly, and we do mention them, because you need to know about the exploits that are possible on your networks. Right. And if you're using one of those devices, the SR20 from TP-Link, um, I think it's probably best that you switch because yeah. they have not patched it yet. Nope. And yeah. it's not looking like they are. Well, yeah, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And for 90 yeah. days, they've said nothing. So yeah, I feel yeah, like... That's it. And now it's a mm -hmm. publicly known exploit. Yeah. So that's, that's where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. Office Depot and Support.com have settled out of court and coughed up $35 million after they were accused of lying to people that their PCs were infected with malware in order to charge them cleanup fees. The lawsuit was brought against them by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, which alleged staff at the tech duo falsely claimed software nasties were lingering on customers' computers to make a fast buck. The lawsuit, filed in Southern Florida, claims the two companies, including Office Depot subsidiary Office Max, from 2009 until November 2016, misrepresented the state of consumers' computers by using a sales tool designed to convince people to pay for diagnostic and repair services. The complaint stated, quote, in, a num in numerous instances throughout this time period, defendants used the PC Health Check program to report to Office Depot's company's customers that the scan had found or identified malware symptoms when it had not done so. Additionally, in numerous instances, the PC Health Check program falsely reported to consumers that the program had found infections on the consumer's computer, end quote. The, according to the watchdog's complaint, the PC Health Check program was incapable of finding malware. Support.com allegedly programmed the software so that whenever an Office Depot company employee checked any one of four checkboxes describing a generic concern, like slowness, before the scan started, the scan would automatically report the detection of malware symptoms and, for a time, infections. The FTC court filing explained 
The PC Health Check Program's detection of malware symptoms was entirely dependent on whether any of the initial checkbox statements was checked and not on the actual state of the computer. The cost for PC Health Check could exceed $300. The defendant, according to the FTC, bilked customers out of tens of millions of dollars. To settle the charges, Office Depot has agreed to pay $25 million and Support.com will pay $10 million. The money will be re refunded to affected customers. So, <laughs> wow. Can you imagine training somebody? Okay, when somebody comes in and they want their computer to be checked, just make sure you check one of those boxes because It then may not be that simple, Sasha. They probably didn't know. I mean, I haven't seen the, the stuff, but I mean, you're not going to make that widely spread to go, hey, by the way, we're going to scam everybody. They probably just said, find out what they're in for. Oh, my computer's slow or my, you know. Uh, and you got to remember, these are like employees at a, a retailer, right? Yeah. right? They're not necessarily highly educated technicians. These are folks that they check off the box and, they, and the software tells them what they're t supposed to respond with. Yeah. Oh, well, the software tells me right. that, yeah, you probably have malware. So, like, it's like, could you imagine if the medical field was like this? Like, do you have a cough? Yes, you're, it's cancer. You're telling <laughs> me that the medical field isn't like that? In it kind of is. Okay. And we're not going to go there. But, we're okay, not going to go I there. I have a question. <laughs> really, that is Didn't related to, to this story. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, this scan had no actual ability to detect whether or not anything was wrong. No, I don't think it said that. What I, it said is that it, it creates a false positive. Right. My I, words, false positive. But it's all so, in the wording. Yeah, it was. It did do a search, but if you ticked one of those boxes, it was programmed to come up with, "Hey, we got a problem." Mm. So right. that it forces you to do a check. I mean, it's like walking, you know, kind of be like walking into a car mechanic and be like, I need to get an oil change. By the way, did you know your oil filter is bad and you haven't filled up your headlight fluid? Right. It's like, oh, please fill up my headlight fluid. Yeah, it's going to be a $35 charge. Right. It's the same deal. It's like you come in for a legit issue. It might be that your brakes are bad, but then they sell you headlight fluid. $300 doesn't fly easily under the radar, I think. Okay, so it, think about does. Who, who are these people who are going into one of these stores to get their computer fixed? It's not the computer technicians. That's right. It's people who right. don't know. Right? It's people who don't know. And, and so you're, you go in, and the, te the person that, that you see as a technician, who's really a salesperson, um, is possibly on commission. Now, I'll just put that out there, but it's quite possible it yep. that you know there are sales targets and there are benefits to making those targets um so do you have you noticed your computer's running a little slow now think about this for a second they just brought their computer into this shop why did they do that because there's something wrong. i packed it up i brought it in Oh, yeah, yeah, I've noticed that it's running a little bit slow. Everybody does. You're running Microsoft Windows. It's been right. up for six exactly. months. You know, hey, have you noticed that it's been having, you know, it's taking its time doing its updates? Yep. Okay, well, you and I know that, hey, it's Windows 10. It's Expect such. But uh, that Just user who's bringing it into to these stores is, yeah, yeah, that's, so oh, yeah. Okay, well, the software says... On my, uh, here's what it says. Oh. You it, like it's a survey, right? It's a survey. Do you do you think this? Yeah, check the box. Do you, is this? Yeah, check the box. And this worded cleverly to make them say yeah, right? Because then I can say, and it's all in the wording, clever wording. Yep. Yeah. These are malware-like symptoms. It's possible that malware could be causing these symptoms. Yeah, malware can cause your computer to be slow. Is this malware? No. But malware can make your updates take a long time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so can just Windows 10. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it's all in the clever wording. And so for that user, they <sighs> just, okay, yeah, all right. So $300 is just like, let's get my computer fixed. I need it back. Right. And people will pay that as opposed to, oh, I got to drop 1200 bucks for a new computer. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. my heart hurts for these people. I'm happy they're getting yeah. their money back. But how many people get taken like this? Yeah. I, like, it happens all the time. It's just unfortunate that in this case, it was so blatant by a company that you would think you can trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, whatever. 
I, I, think I wish we could help everybody. Like, and I get I phone calls from all over Canada and the United States saying, you know, can how who can I get to fix this for me? And uh, like, do you do you have a friend or a trusted relative that that yeah. can help you with this? Mm-hmm. And you know, so quite often it's not. No, I don't know anyone who's good with computers. So you've got to take it into someone to fix it. Do you know who can fix it for you? No, I don't. I'll well, take it back to guess where they're it. going. Yeah. Well, yeah, go into the retailer yeah. that they bought it at. Well, I've, like, I've got a friend, she regularly connects with me going, okay, this is going on, how do I fix this? And so I'll try and walk it through it. I but, have that friend. Well, <laughs> but we, like, we live a couple hours away, and so <laughs> I can't be like, well, this is what you do. So quite often she's like, I'm going to go to, I think sure. it's the Geek Squad. Sure. Wherever. So any like, of these guys, and she just yeah. walks in and she's like, oh, they're so nice. They help me all the time. Good. Something like this, get, she would not think to yeah. you know. question it in yeah. any way. Yeah. It, ah, so scammy. Yeah. yeah. So be careful out there, poor folks. People. Yep. And I think as the te- technically savvy folks, maybe it's a bit of our responsibility to, to try to direct these people. It's just like when we are trying to teach folks how to recognize a phishing scam. We'll try to recognize the signs of this type of thing happening. And, and just because this one has been stopped and thwarted and they're paying the fees and they're stopping doing what they're doing, it doesn't mean that they're not out there. So right. um, when, when one of my friends was looking at buying a house, she's never bought a house before, mm-hmm. so she called up somebody locally that she knew that has bought houses before and brought him with her to meet with the homeowner and to meet with the realtor because she recognized that you know what I I I really need somebody who knows what they're talking about Mm -hmm. so maybe your tech friend doesn't have the time to fix it for you but maybe your tech friend could go with you to that shop and say you know what there's something shady about uh, and maybe yes. you can be that friend. Maybe you can be that person who you don't have the time to fix it, but you could go with them to the technical place right. that's going to fix it for them and say, you know what, um, I don't trust them. Maybe we need to try the next guy. Or maybe it's, you know what, everything that they said made sense. They, they absolutely, absolutely that, that they checked all the boxes and it is definitely malware. <laughs> right? So be that yes. friend. I mean, we can be that friend. We don't have time to fix it. So be the friend who can at least go with them. Exactly. And make sense of it. Or at everything. least refer them back to this episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And then they'll be calling on you anyways, because they'll be like, he said, be that friend. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Effective immediately, Microsoft is ending all ebook sales in its Microsoft stores for Windows PCs. Previously purchased ebooks will be removed from users' libraries in early July. Even free ones will be deleted. The company will offer full refunds to any users for any books they've purchased or pre-ordered. The move is a part of a strategy to help streamline the focus of the Microsoft Store. It seems that the company no longer has an interest in trying to compete with Amazon, Apple Books, and Google Play Books. It's a bit hard to imagine why anyone would go with Microsoft over those options anyway. If you have purchased eBooks from Microsoft, you can continue acting accessing them through the Edge browser until everything vanishes in July. After that, customers can expect to automatically receive a refund. If your original payment method is no longer valid or if you used a gift card, you'll receive a credit back to your Microsoft account for use at the online Microsoft Store. Microsoft will also offer an additional $25 credit to your Microsoft account if you an- annotated or marked any of the ebooks that you purchased from the Microsoft Store prior to April 2nd, 2019. I didn't even so, know that they sold ebooks. Well, they don't now. I don't think they did. <laughs> but if they there, did. There are one ebook they sold if you bought yeah. it. <laughs> this is not working out. Come on. This is a bad move. It's a book on how to. S- it's buy like Vista books. all over again. Right. Yeah. So, but that's exactly it. It's like it's another thing that Microsoft's gone. Eh, we're not so good at this. We're going to get out of it. We're out. Yeah. Not which, that Google has ever done that. Google <laughs> Plus. <laughs> yeah. But it's a smart move. Microsoft didn't do a very good job selling books. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. My perspective is completely different. My perspective is this. And we've had this discussion. Maybe you, you do tell. I don't like that a company that I'm purchasing from can renege on the things that I've purchased. So, uh, and I'm the guy who still buys physical copies of CDs, compact discs right. for you youngins. 
that's he does. And then I rip them to MP3s, and then I have my digital copy, and I can do whatever I want with it. Right. I don't buy iTunes downloads. I don't buy MP3 downloads or any any of those kinds of things. Or I buy physical media. That's I'm old school a little bit. I know. I buy DVDs and I rip them to my Plex server. I don't buy videos that are streaming through, um, like I'll rent videos. Right. Because like if I was to go to a rental store, I know I right. only have it for 24 hours anyways. But if I expect to keep it, I would never buy a digital video right. from someone like, um, uh, like uh, who is it that we get our rentals from? Um, um. The movie theater, Galaxy. Oh, um, block. No. no, not Blockbuster. <laughs> like, Cineplex. 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 Cineplex store. Oh, yeah. yeah they you can rent do. stuff. So yeah. I rent my videos through them, yes. but I would never buy one. But that's me. I but would f- physically buy a DVD could, and then I would have a copy. But could you not? And this is what I'm confused about in, in this is, yeah. okay, you buy a book. Well, it turns out you rent it because they're taking yeah. it back. But you buy a book from the store. Can't you copy it to something else? Can no. you back it up? You can't do anything with no, it? No, that's not true. Not necessarily. Well, but yeah. if they have control, well, you'd yeah. have to find it within the file system, and then you have, like. It, but it all depends on the fo- file format. Yeah, like if it's if it's an. EPUB. Are you a hacker or are you not a? Ha- oh yeah, but an EPUB file is different. A PDF file is right. different right. from buying a f- uh, a book right. from a store that gives you access to it within the store. Like if if you had a Kindle app and you right. bought the book and you paid for the book. You can't take that out of the Kindle app. So if Kindle decided to just suddenly shut down, which they're not, they're Amazon's doing okay last I checked. Right. But if they did shut it down, I would just lose that book. It would not be what accessible the anymore. Fine print I want says. the physical book. Right? The yeah. fine print says they still own they can that, cont- yeah, and so they get around it because they'll just it refund the whole it time to you. for like twenty five ninety nine or whatever what your ebook costs though, you. Is what happens then to the money that was paid to the publisher? Mm. So if they're taking all the money back, yeah. are they going to turn around and go to the publisher and be like, yeah, all we did was rent? Yeah, we want that money back. Uh, good but thing we they only are sold not, one book. We're not hearing about that, though, are we? No, but no. that is that the other side of it? Maybe it is. It's a good thought, Jeff. I would tell you. I, I have one per year. I just started listening to an audiobook in yes. my car during my drives and I would be livid if cuz I am deep in it now and I yeah. am hooked. Oh, if it's all, l- like I know where you're going. If they took that from me, I would be really upset. Netflix removed Backyardigans. What? I'm just saying. <gasps> my kids was into Backyardigans. <laughs> When Netflix pulled it from the lineup. Yeah. And so it's the same kind of thing, right? Nothing stays on Netflix forever. I know, I know. So why, like, you know what you're getting. Netflix is different, though, because you're paying a fee. Uh, You're not buying the program. Right, you're If I buy a book, yeah. But I, I think you've got a really kind of an interesting thought where what happens to the publisher? My wife is an author, and she publishes through KDP, right. Kindle Direct. So you can buy her books on Kindle. Well, what if they suddenly said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And they, they can't take the money back from the office. No, they can't. No. So Could they? No. I don't But it know. hurts the authors. I sure. Because how many people are going, well, I had that book, but now I don't have the book anymore. Yeah, what was the book again? <gasps> I don't remember. Maybe it helps the authors. Maybe now they have to go buy the hard copy. Maybe they're halfway through the book, and they're like, oh, I need to finish this. I need to order it from yeah. Amazon. Well, but at the same time, it's like we're talking about Microsoft Store. I don't think it's that big of a player in the market. No, I feel like they it's can true. afford to pay everybody back their money. And So how many of you bought a Bitcoin, a single Bitcoin last week? I don't have that kind of money. Had I, had I <laughs> bought a Bitcoin, what well, would have happened to me? Let's look week? at what CoinGecko says about the crypto market and how it looked as of 1,800 hours on August, 4, uh, August 3rd, 2019. If you bought a Bitcoin last week, so one week ago from when we broadcast this show. Would I be laughing? You would have an extra $1,214.01 US in your bank account from one Bitcoin. It is up to $5,233.02 US. It's a pretty big game. Kind of nice. Uh, that would be a good week. All those people who have thousands of Bitcoin. They're- 
That's right. You got me wrong. Yeah. Uh, okay. They lost since like. <laughs> yeah. It was twenty one thousand. A yeah. couple. Of years. Yeah. Litecoin is up as well. Ninety five dollars and seventy cents this week. Uh, up from sixty one last week. Ethereum also on the rise. Uh, up at one hundred and seventy six dollars and fifty four cents, gaining thirty eight dollars and sixty four cents. So hmm. we're on the up and up. Monero also gaining uh, at seventy-one dollars and twenty-seven cents per Monero. Now, Jeff, are you ready for Stellite? I am. It's the only one that lost at zero point zero four ten thousandths of a cent drop. It's down at one point five six ten thousandths of a cent. And Turtle Coin is in fact gaining and uh, is up uh, higher than Stellite this week at one point seven ten thousandths of a cent. You go, little guy. It's just a little, little bitty thing. But you can have billions of turtle coin. That's uh, all relative, right? I feel like we ne now need a hair coin. Hair coin? No, yeah, I would do we got, very poorly with this. We got the this. turtle and the hair. Huh. And so the, oh, that kind of hair. So then the hair goes okay. really fast. Like, where are you going crashes. with this, Jeff? Jeff is like, I would have hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do remember, if you decide to invest in the cryptocurrency market, that it is always volatile and never closes. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. All right, we've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, we are going to be getting into our Maker of the Month. Yeah. Yay. Stick around. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit Category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners, and thank you for watching. So let's get into our first ever Maker of the Month. You can head on over to cat5.tv slash maker001 to learn all about what Sean M. Tracy has created. Are you ready for this? Yes, I am. Okay. You have always wanted to take a Raspberry Pi and make what? A picture frame that displays pictures. Uh, close. I've wanted it to display like weather and alerts while I'm standing in front of the mirror. All kinds of like the, yeah, the mirror displays. Those kinds of projects are really super totally cool. Totally fun. Right. We've seen them all over the web. Yeah. Picture frames, mirrors, those kinds of like uh, screens powered by a Raspberry Pi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, what Sean M. Tracy has done differently is taken that and added Watson AI. Artificial like intelligence. Watson, like supercomputer Watson? Yes. Yes. So tapped into the AI. You ready for this? Let's jump over to my computer screen here. Um, it, he calls it the InstaFrame. And Sean was looking for a gift for his mom mm -hmm. for okay. Christmas, just this past Christmas, a couple months back, and, and finally came up with this idea. I'm going to make a Raspberry Pi powered picture frame Okay. that is going to have pictures on it. And which you've heard of, yeah. and you, hey, everybody's, that's, the thing. Yeah, that's no big deal, right? Everybody's done that. But he's tapped into Watson AI so that when his mom looks down at that picture frame, the only pictures that appear on that, even though they are sourced from Instagram, are pictures of her grandchildren. Just when mom looks at it or it no, just no, no, in general? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> no, 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 no. So understand. So using <laughs> facial recognition, AI technology, Sean has now taken this picture frame, had it go out on the internet to Instagram and grabbed all of the pictures from his feed and using oh. facial recognition, he's uploaded like 40 different pictures of each of those kids so that the AI would recognize them. Right. So now the AI says, oh yeah, that's 
his niece and that's his nephew and those are the pictures that are displayed on this picture frame cool. so now uh, this picture frame once it's all said and done and head on over to cat5.tv slash maker zero zero one there it is. So he's the whole project is outlined here. Shows you how he built it, how it, how it was put together, and there's the final product. The picture frame, Jeff, shows only pictures of his niece and nephew. That's cool. But all through AI, so he could upload any pictures to his account that he wants. But the picture frame will still only show the as soon as a picture shows up of the kids. Boom. Now what I want to know is. Does he have the ability to remotely pop in to update if... Say, I don't see why not. So then this would make for a great April Fool's frame as well. <laughs> <laughs> Just suddenly switch all the photos to something else. <laughs> wow, Jeff. That could happen. That's uh, Sean, there's your idea for April Fool's next year because we're just a little bit late. The next month? <laughs> Head on over to cat5.tv slash maker001. You'll find out what, uh, what Sean has done. I don't think that he's made it like into like bananas and whatever else it's, that would be it's the kids i would totally facial recognition built into a picture frame though it's like it's w- very cool. what manufacturer is going to pick up on this and say this is a cool feature it, that is really cool i want to know if watson will notice as the children progress in age and update and take yeah like the but keep the young pictures Right, right. right. Well, he could, uh, I mean, here's a theoretical for you, but just uh, it works by providing pictures that the uh, AI can reference. Right. So that it can recognize that those kids are the kids. Right. Those are the kids that we're going to display. So uh, there's nothing to stop him from uploading another 40 pictures as the kids age, and then Watson will learn from that Mm -hmm. and and start displaying those as well. But I'm wondering, will... would Watson just learn on his own as the kids age? Yeah, sure. Would huh. Maybe I would think so. I would think so because kids yeah. age subtly. It's not like yeah. they change yeah. facially. Amazing. I, yeah. Well, I th- I, you say that, but there's some days I come home and I'm like, "Wow, my kids have grown." <laughs> <laughs> it's like that you, was quick. You work a lot, Jeff. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this just turns sad. Oh, what I love about Sean's project, though, <laughs> is like, yeah, you can take all the pictures of your kids and put it on an SD card and plug it into a picture frame, and there you go. But uh, then you gotta update it, mm-hmm. and and I, I, it gets to be a chore if you've gotta update it, mm-hmm. and and certainly if it's a gift, um, to to need to update it at someone else's house is a little bit more onerous. So here, as he uploads more pictures to his Instagram account, it's immediately available yeah. to the picture frame. Which is I love Absolutely this. Absolutely awesome. Well done, Sean. Congratulations on becoming our first ever maker of the month here on Category 5 TV. Again, check out his project at cat5.tv slash maker001. That's fun. In my pocket. You know what's in there. It's called a Data Traveler 2000 from Kingston. Love that thing. We've been giving these things away, and we've got one more for you. Uh, If you would like to qualify for an encrypted USB flash drive, this is uh, the flash drive that has a built-in keypad. So check this out. That keypad is where I punch in my password. And when I punch it in, it decrypts the drive so I can plug it into my computer, plug it into my TV set, my set-top box, whatever I want to connect it to, Mm -hmm. and it will have decrypted data until I unplug it and it immediately becomes encrypted again. Right. Fantastic. We're giving those away. All you have to do is email contest at category5.tv and let us know uh, where you are writing us from, where you're watching from, just so that we know um, where our viewers are. And uh, in the subject line, I want you to put Kingston giveaway, just so that we know as well where that, uh, where that is going to be, uh, wh- where we're going to cast that ballot. Beautiful. Yeah. I use mine all well, Good luck. Me too. I love it. I keep mm-hmm. it on me all the time. It's not just a prop. <laughs> uh, thank you to those who have pitched in um, a, something uh, a little extra toward our server build. Uh, we do need to build a new broadcast server for Category 5 TV, and your contributions are helping us to make that a possibility this spring. Uh, head on over to donate.category5.tv in order to pitch in. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to become a patron, there's a great way for you to become uh, a supporter of the show and what we do here at Category 5 TV, which we do for free. But by becoming a patron, we give you extra content, we give you access to, to extra stuff that is not available to 
to the general public, uh, but also the funds help us to be able to afford uh, what we do and what we offer here at Category 5 TV for free. Uh, so thank you to those who have been contributing. Um, and that's all the time that we have for this week. Yeah. Wow, that was fast. The time just Lots flies by. Thanks, you two, for being here. And thanks, everybody, for being here. It's nice to see Jeff again. I exist. Yay. Yeah, I know. It's like, who is this bearded man? I know. If all goes well, I should be here for the next little bit. Exceptional. Well, we're looking forward to it. Thank you for joining us this week. Don't forget, we are on Twitter, at Category5TV. Also, if you want to follow me personally, I am at Robbie Ferguson. Are you on Twitter? Uh, that I'm response not. was not very confident, so I would say that's... Oh, yeah, I have a Twitter account, but I don't update it. I update mine all the time, and I follow back. So, at Robbie Ferguson, right here, uh, you'll get a follower for sure. Uh, we're also on YouTube. Category 5 TV. Um, if you want, you can tune in to linuxtechshow.com, which will reroute you to YouTube, a special channel that is edited down copies of Category 5 TV. So our one-hour show becomes a whole bunch of little 10-minute mm -hmm. clips, and that's a great way to watch Category 5 as well. We're also on Roku's channel store. You can catch us on Plex or Kodi channels. Uh, you can get those at Cat5 TV on GitHub. You'll find those. Um, also, our main website brings everything together at Category Category5.tv, so check out that website as well. It's been fun having you here. Hope everybody has a great week. You too? Yes. Nice to see you, and have a fantastic week. You as well. See ya. Bye.